Welcome uh, everybody that is here. You are welcome to send a message in the chat and tell us where you are joining from, um, what has brought you here today, what you're interested in hearing about. If you have any questions, please post it in the Q and A. Um, We'll also be looking in the chat, but it's just easier to keep track of questions in the Q&A. So if you have anything ahead of the time that's on your mind. Hi, George. Um, hi, Robert. From Greece, that is really awesome. That's really awesome. From China, oh, that's amazing. Um, Washington, oh, we've got people from all over. Bloemfontein, that's great to see. South Africa and Shana from South Africa. That's really cool. Cape Town. I'm also in Cape Town, but I'm the only one in this um, on the panel here from Cape Town. Um, JJ is an immunologist from Cape Town. That's really awesome. Germany, Germany, Josie. That's cool. Ireland, Ireland. Hi, Leo. Also in Cape Town, we've got some Northwest University prof, maybe you know. Yes. Yeah. Okay, guys. Okay. So thank you for the engagement. I think it's always really exciting to see people from all over the world. And if you want to message one another, please do so. Um, yes, the webinar is going to be recorded. So um, my name is Nanine Bema, and I am the Programs Coordinator at the Physicians Association for Nutrition South Africa, or what I will refer to as PAN South Africa. So we're here today uh, with the Public Health Association for South Africa, their special interest group, Climate, Energy and Health. And we're here to deliver a webinar on the link between nutrition and climate change. For the health professionals in the audience, there is, um, it is registered for CPD points. At the end of the talk, I will post a link to a feedback form, which you will have to fill in to get your CPD points. So to just give us some context and an introduction, um, uh, the topic of climate change reached a milestone during December 2015 when the Paris Agreement was signed at COP21. So this is a legally binding international treaty that was adopted by 196 parties that initiated a worldwide commitment to limiting global warming to well below two degrees Celsius. So a lot of time has passed since 2015 and we have witnessed massive global transformations since then. So now it is 2021 and we're understanding that the planetary changes that are happening is very complex and we need a lot of effort and a lot of collaboration to fight climate change. So in order to reach our ambitious targets, we need to execute a collaborative approach. We must work together across departments to recognize our individual and collective impacts and how we can best minimize these impacts. So we are here at, um, at a collaborative live webinar and we are going to learn from individuals who have experience within the fields of medicine, geophysics and public health to begin to understand how climate change is affecting global health, what is the role of nutrition and what can we do about it. Our first panelist is Prof Gidon Eschel. He is a research professor of environmental physics at Bard College. He studied physics and earth sciences in Israel and uh, received qualifications in mathematical geophysics. He is best known for his work on quantifying geophysical consequences of agriculture and diet. So um, all of the other panelists can turn off their cameras and get on, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. Uh, right. Okay, share okay. Uh, I take that. I can see your share, yes. Okay, good. Okay, so <clears throat> good morning or afternoon as the case may be for everybody. 
Um, and this is uh, what I'm going to try to talk to you uh, in the next uh, uh, 10 minutes or so, okay? Do our dietary choices uh, impact Earth? And if so, how? Okay. Uh, uh, it is okay. Um, so this is from a, a, a paper that uh, just a few months old. Um, where I devised this uh, uh, sort of a universal method of evaluating what's important quantitatively in uh, uh, what impacts are really important in dietary choices. And uh, contrary to popular belief, uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, are actually uh, uh, the least uh, important, the most important is soil uh, uh, conservation. We, we, soil is a, a, a resource that is uh, renewable on a time scale of uh, tens to hundreds of thousands of years. And we've gone through about a third of the reservoir we have uh, in under a century, really. So that's crucially important. Uh, water, uh, this is for the US, so water in the, in the West is the second most important. Then there's this one, which I'll uh, talk about. Um, uh, so ba basically the taller uh, a bar is, the more important the effect of diet uh, on the particular challenge. And uh, you see that in greenhouse gas emissions, while it is, the most important environmental challenge that we have, we can impact that better uh, by other choices, but our choices, dietary choices, still have an enormous impact. I'll explain that momentarily. Let's focus on two things, okay? Um, and that is related to water pollution by this process called eutrophication. So if you look at a, at, at a nice, uh, a nice uh, natural environment like, like this uh, forest brook in, in, in the upper right, um, uh, about two or three percent, in many cases even less, of all the nitrogen that falls on it from the heavens is discharged out as um, dissolved nitrog nitrogen in the stream. Nearly everything is locally cycled, uh, essentially uh, producing uh, proteins uh, by the plants that stay on the uh, spot receiving that uh, atmospheric bounty. And so only two, 3% go into uh, ultimately the ocean. Agriculture is obviously very, very, very different. We perturb basically everything uh, that happens in the soil. Uh, this is uh, supposed to represent sort of uh, local recycling of nitrogen species by soil microbiota. And we perturb agricultural lands to such a degree that up to half of everything that we apply, and this is not naturally uh, applied uh, nitrogen like here, this is applied by mechanical means, and uh, upward, uh, uh, up to a half uh, goes into the ocean. Uh, that creates uh, huge problems once it enters the, the coastal ocean. And this is an example from uh, right near the mouth of the Mississippi River. And those uh, sort of ominous looking colors show you uh, uh, contours of dissolved oxygen in the water. And uh, you, you see normal blue ocean dissolved oxygen values were range between about 10 to over 100 uh, in stormy areas, uh, milligrams uh, of dissolved oxygen per per liter. Here you see values as low as two or one even. And that's essentially the death sentence for all the life, all the marine life that is here. For uh, reasons that we understand geophysically perfectly well. Uh, and this is what it uh, looks like from space. So to Put that in perspective for, for you, your dietary choices. When you eat something, 
probably somebody applied fertilizer. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's, man well, it matters a little bit, but not fundamentally if it's manure or, uh, or synthetic fertilizer. And, and uh, when you make choice A versus choice B, you can, re uh, uh, you, the difference between them can make enormous difference to your contribution, the contribution of your diet to this massive die-off of uh, ocean life. Um, I, I'm sorry, it, it's Andrew here. There's a dark patch on your screen. I saw you reduce it with an arrow right at the beginning and it's hiding a bit of the data. Maybe you can... Uh, uh, what was that? I didn't, I'm sorry, I, I didn't the, hear. There's that... Your, your arrow is over a darkish patch, which is obscuring your screen. Hmm. You can't see it. Okay, it's, it's, not a, it's, it's only hidden a little bit, I'm just saying. Um, but I, I, I can't see it, so I don't yeah. know what to do about yeah. it. In the beginning, I saw you draw it down. I thought you could do it. I, I'm not sure what it is. Okay. Um. So can people see it or not? I'm confused. Yes, we can see the slide. It's just on the side. Let's, let's pull something right across. Now it's gone. It's gone. I don't know okay. what you've done, but carry on. It's perfect. Okay. So the next issue uh, that is uh, for which dietary choices are extremely important is land occupation. So let's put this in perspective. Why is it uh, important? Um, this is uh, uh, total, this bar is total earth surface uh, of which 71% is ocean and 29% is land. Of that land, some of it is glaciers and the Sahara Desert or the Kalahari for the, for the African crowd. Um, and 71% uh, is what's called habitable, okay? Of that habitable land, half is devoted to agriculture. So there is one aspect, our lives are so rich, uh, you know, in so we do so many different things, but one aspect of our lives claims, lays claim to one half of all habitable land on earth, and that's uh, agriculture. So that is extremely important. And if you look at the, uh, rate, uh, is, so the horizontal axis here is time from 1600 uh, to a few years ago, and uh, you see the, uh, the combination of cropland and grazeland um, over this time in various regions uh, shown in, uh, in, in those different colors. And I put here, uh, th these are the absolute values of the, of the occupation, but, but this shows you the percentage of the global habitable land. Uh, we are really, really pushing uh, uh, our planetary boundaries. And you can see that in many areas, the rise has stopped, for example, here or here, or even began to decline like here. Uh, what does that mean? Of course, there are more and more mouths every day to feed. So it's not like we don't need more expansion. We do, but there isn't any to expand into. And that, that is an extremely important uh, question. So uh, uh, these are some examples of the places I uh, shop or on the left. Uh, dishes that I make. This this one is is chickpeas and pine nuts. Um, but can your uh, dietary choices have a meaningful impact? Uh, it, it's very easy to say. Well, I did, these are colossally complex global problems. Can I possibly make it a difference? So the answer is uh, yes. Yes, an emphatic uh, yes. And here is an example. Um, of the uh, uh, square meters that are needed to produce uh, 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 the needs of one person per day. This is using beef. So uh, uh, the average American eats about 190 uh, kilocalories a day of beef. This is how many uh, square meters you need to produce this. This 
is a, a very uh, large calculation that basically says, can I take the diet, the dietary contributions of 190 kilocalories of beef and devise a, a very um, uh, rich and diverse plant-based diet uh, that has the same amount of protein as the beef, foregone beef, and is superior in any other nutritional way. And this is how much these uh, plants will collectively require. You see, this is less than a third of the land. This is all uh, the, the land requirement of all meat. Uh, so this is only beef, this is all meat, and this is their plant alternative. So the difference between this and this, or this and this, which is uh, these are only a, between 20 to 35% of the respective uh, meat counterparts. So it, uh, it is a huge, huge saving of land. Okay. And here are other uh, savings. So this is what I uh, just showed you, uh, the land. This is reactive nitrogen. This is uh, our contribution to water pollution and uh, coastal ocean die-offs. Again, huge differences in plant needs versus those of, uh, of um, uh, meat alternative. And this is emissions. So you see the emissions indeed are vastly lower in the plant alternative uh, as uh, compared to the meat they replace. What about nutrition? Uh, many people, most people I, I, I think, uh, here are interested in nutrition. So these are uh, uh, the differences in uh, ingestion of various uh, uh, specific nutrients. Uh, the difference between if you take, uh, if your diet comprises the beef or meat versus a diet uh, that has the same amount of protein, but from uh, plant sources. And meats, I, I wanna emphasize, 43 nutritional constraints, for example, not too little uh, of vitamin C and not too much of uh, zinc and so forth, okay? Uh, all of, uh, so if you have a bar that goes strongly to the left, to the right, it means that the plant alternative diet gives you a lot more of that. And you see all the ones that we see here, all the ones have, um, higher contribution from the plants. These little piddly little uh, bars are what the meat contributes. These massive ones are what the plants can contribute. And you see folate, beta carotene, vitamin K, uh, vitamin A, soluble fiber, da, 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 da. The list goes on, but you get much more of protective nutrients and far less of uh, um, nutrients that are known uh, to be associated with, uh, at least from a public health perspective, with ill health. The only exception is B12. And B12 is true, you, you, you just uh, uh, have a teaspoon of, uh, uh, of brewer's yeast and you're done. So um, it's not an issue. Everything else, you get vastly more of the protective nutrients. What about um, uh, where uh, the makeup of these diets? So let's look, for example, at this panel right here. Uh, these uh, are the key contributors of protein. Uh, you can't see it here, but this says protein, okay? So peanuts, tofu, soybean, lentils, kidney beans, that's where one gets their um, uh, protein contribution in the alternative uh, diets. And you have here all the uh, references for those who want. Um, let's uh, skip that. Uh, here, uh, this is a different calculation, but again, you see how much cropland is needed in the mixed diet in red and how much is needed by the plant alternative. I, I wanna emphasize again, that is nutritionally superior and protein conserving as compared to, uh, to the beef. So uh, it will be most unreasonable to say that there is any nutritional sacrifice being made here. It will be far more persuasive to say that there are huge environmental gains as shown here. At the same time, 
that one reaps huge nutritional benefits as well. Let me give you here uh, a nice uh, a bottom line of a nice calculation that we did. Suppose all Americans replace their beef with chicken. What will happen? This is th these are all the different feed inputs into those industries. Okay, and beef results in uh, three percent of the protein uh, coming in. Three percent of the protein in the feed actually ends up as beef protein and 97% uh, is lost. That's this massive droopy arrow. Uh, chickens are far more efficient. So check this out. If we were to make this change for all Americans, we will get almost four times as much protein. And look at this. How many more millions Americans can we support on the saved resources? 142 million Americans. And that's for the entire annual diet. So that's like half the country can be sustained if all Americans do this one small change. Forgo beef altogether and replace the protein that you now get from it with poultry. So my conclusions are pretty straightforward. Dietary choices are enormously important, of course, nutritionally, but also environmentally. The magnitudes of the uh, benefits offered by the right dietary choices are very hard to top or even match in diet unrelated personal decision. What I mean by that, suppose you change from a regular car to the most efficient Tesla, let's say, or something like that. Okay. You get maybe 40%, um, 50% improvement. Here you get, uh, you, you, you can get 50 fold improvement. You can take whatever land needs you now have and drop it to, uh, to one fiftieth of what it is now. So there is no uh, other aspect of life in which the, uh, the correct choice will offer you this much uh, savings. Most important decision to make, if you so choose, eliminate beef, any beef. Not, there are no exceptions to that. I fail to quote close the parentheses here. There is a, a near perfect alignment of what is good for you and what is good for the planet. There are very, very few exceptions um, where you have to weigh and say, okay, do I improve my uh, nutritional profile or do I uh, reduce my environmental impact? Most often the two point in the exact same direction. And thank you very much. Thank you so much for, for that talk um, and understanding um, how our dietary impacts affect the earth and what, what is involved there in that discussion. So we're going to be um, moving on to our next panelist um, who will be addressing how climate change is affecting food safety. So it's Dr. Cliff Zanyemba and he has a PhD in public health from the University of Cape Town. His PhD research focused on characterizing the relationship between climate change and agricultural use of and exposure to endocrine disrupting pesticides. So he's currently working as a lecturer at the University of Zimbabwe. And I will hand it over to you, Cliff. You're still on mute, so. All right, yeah. Right, thanks, Lenin, and uh, it is a pleasure for me to, to be speaking to you, everyone today. Uh, I always like to talk about uh, climate change and pesticides and health, and it's always very difficult for me to decide what not to talk about. So today, it took me quite a while to, to decide what not to include in this presentation, uh, but I hope you are going to learn something. You are going to learn 
especially those who are not familiar with the, the issues that surround climate change and pesticides and health. So I'm just going to stop my video so that I can concentrate on my presentation and uh, I will switch it on at the end. All right. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, the relationship between climate change and food safety uh, in the context of uh, pesticide contamination and uh, mycotoxin contamination. So just to, to start with the definition of climate change, uh, a lot of people probably, there are quite a number who actually don't know what climate change really means, uh, but in simple terms, we're looking at uh, alterations in the long-term weather characteristics and what we are really interested in uh, is the changes that are happening in the temperature. So the temperatures are getting warmer and then the rainfall is really becoming variable. And uh, we've um, observed quite a number of impacts of climate change, which uh, have uh, implications on food security as well as food safety. So for instance, uh, in Southern Africa, we are actually noticing that the growing season is actually changing. Uh, in certain instances, it's, it's coming late or it's becoming shorter. And that's got implications on food security. We are also experiencing frequent droughts and heat waves. Those also have implications on food security. And what is interesting for us today is uh, the aspect uh, on food safety. We are noticing that uh, climate change is impacting on plant diseases and plant pests, which are actually important in terms of uh, food, um, food safety. So my presentation today, I'm just going to I've decided to divide it into three parts. So the first part is just going to be on climate change and pests and pesticides. And then the second part is on climate change and mycotoxins. And the final part is going to just to put everything in the South African context, because I understand we have uh, quite a huge South African audience and students who are following this. All right, so what are the impacts of climate change on insect pests, there've actually been several observations that uh, climate change is actually resulting in pests colonizing new geographical areas, as well as uh, the pests are now also surviving through the winter season. So this is actually based on the observations that are the, the number of frost-free days is actually increasing, especially here in Southern Africa. And that means pests can now survive the winter because it's actually getting warm for them. So they are not hibern hibernating anymore. And another observation that's been made again, also in the Southern African region is uh, the proliferation of pests, insect pests in agriculture. So populations are increasing, uh, the growth rates is and so as uh, the generations of pests is also increasing. So these changes that are happening in terms of pests are very important for us because uh, of the implications. What that implies is when pest populations are growing, there are also significant losses that are happening in terms of food. So losses that are occurring was crops are in the field and additional losses that also okay after harvest. And climate change is a recognized driver of these losses that are happening. Uh, and uh, an important observation, what's really interesting is to note that uh, to avert food insecurity as a result of crop losses, we are now actually risking food safety through adaptive use of pesticides. So a research which I did with my colleagues uh, at the University of Cape Town, 
which we published recently shows that uh, when farmers encounter insects on their farms, what they immediately do is to go and get pesticides. They just increase the amount of pesticides which they spray. But another important thing is that even when it's based on their perceptions that climate change is increasing this insect pest, they still use increasing amount of pesticides. And we call that incremental adaptation. And that is actually of concern to all of us, especially those who are following today interested in issues to do with food safety. And the concern is that when pesticides are used and then food is delivered uh, on the table, food often contains some pesticide residues. So these residues are just those uh, remainders of pesticides which, are, which you find still stuck, maybe it can be, okay, you actually don't see them, but they will still be found in food, for instance, fruits, vegetables, cereal grains, meat, and even milk products. Milk products, you still find these pesticide residues. And that is a concern now for us because if climate change is causing farmers to use increasing amount, amounts of pesticides that then also results in increasing amounts of these food residues that you find in the, in your food. And in some cases or in many cases, pesticide residues, residues are maybe beyond the control of the consumer, but of course there are quite a number of uh, processing techniques that can be that can be employed, including simply washing a fruit before eating. It reduces the residues, cooking, boiling. Those are some of the simplest ways of, um, of treating your food before you eat to reduce the pesticide residues, right? And then uh, the issue of climate change and mycotoxins and, um, and food safety, right? So, Mycotoxins simply refers to, to food molds. So the molds that you find when your food is molding, those are the, the, the mycotoxins that we are talking about. And then there are always, there are also a lot of groups. They can be grouped into uh, other classes, but uh, we're just going to talk about mycotoxins in general. So they are produced by fungal action whilst crops are still in the field, when they have been harvested, or even when food is processed. And what is important and interesting within the context of climate change is that uh, issues to do with drought and insect activity, the insect activity that we talked about and drought, these are very important in determining contamination of food by mycotoxins. And uh, others have actually commented that uh, if you see particularly maize, I'm going to talk about maize in the context of South Africa, but if you see your maize being damaged by insects, that can actually be a good predictor of uh, my mycotoxin contamination. So you you have to be careful if you are a farmer, but the challenge also is for mycotoxins, which is a, another issue, again, that results in, in pesticide use. Farmers can use um, fungicides, but fungicides are a, a special type or a group of pesticides. So pesticides with insecticides, uh, fungicides and so forth. So farmers, when they use fungicides to deal with mycotoxins, and then when they sell their food on the market, as a consumer, you have to be aware that you are potentially exposed to two things, the pesticide that's been used to treat the food 
as well as the mycotoxins which are still there on that food. So climate change really represents a key factor in driving mycotoxin contamination, but also driving pesticide contamination. Quite a number of food crops are susceptible to the attack by mycotoxins. The, the, the list is endless. Uh, and the effects of mycotoxin uh, con uh, contamination or exposure include cancers, immunosuppression. And uh, what is interesting is the research that is actually going on is that uh, it, it, there's an indication that there's an interaction between chronic mycotoxin exposure and uh, uh, malnutrition, immunosuppression, and an interaction also again with um, HIV and AIDS, which is again very important in the context of uh, the Southern Africa region in general, where uh, the cases of HIV and AIDS are still quite quite high, even though we've made significant progress in reducing infections. All right. So the final part that I'm going to talk about here is uh, the South African context. All right. So in South Africa, the temperature increases in temperature are really the threat to agricultural production, to food safety as well as um, food security. The temperature is showing an upward trend, and that's really a, a regional, a, a, a regional uh, characteristic. It's the whole Southern African region, which is actually warming faster than the rest of the world. So this is very important. And we are in the Southern African region. We are really concerned about climate change, we should be concerned about climate change the way small island states are also concerned about climate change because we are impacted in a very special way, in a, in a very significant way when temperatures are really going up like that. Then in terms of rainfall in South Africa, the country, is experiencing long dry spells and also some droughts. I remember the Cape Town or the Western Cape drought of, uh, was it 2017, 2018? At that time I, I was in, staying in Cape Town and it, was a, and it was really a difficult period. What we're observing, like I've already mentioned, is that uh, the cropping season is also changing in some instances it's becoming shorter it's coming late and uh increasing demand on irrigation so demand for water for irrigation purposes because of this negative balance in terms of water supply that's happening now so evapotranspiration is now another issue of concern for us here in Southern Africa and South Africa in particular. Issues to do with the uh, pest and diseases. So there's ongoing research in South Africa. There have also been quite a few publications on the relationship between the agricultural pests, agricultural diseases and uh, the impact of climate change on this, but there's really still a lot of research that needs to be done in that, in that area. But uh, there's an interesting study that was done in Limpopo where farmers actually perceived that um, climate change is in influencing pest activity. And when farmers make those observations, what they do, like I said earlier on, they just increase their usage of pesticides. and. Uh, if you look at that map of of, uh, of the world, so it's a, a pesticide uh, use map. You can see that of all the African countries, South Africa is the only country in, in red. Maybe there's also Libya there, but South Africa is a, the, 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 or is it Tunisia, but South Africa 
is the country in red. And that's a concern because South Africa is the largest consumer of pesticides in Africa. But South Africa also exports its fruits and vegetables to the rest of Southern Africa. So what happens in South Africa when South Africa, what happens in South Africa in terms of pesticide use and food safety has got a regional uh, uh, ramification. So that's very important for listeners from other parts of Africa, Southern Africa who are here today. And uh, there are quite a number of studies, South African studies that have documented the, the link that exists between pesticide exposure and uh, acute and chronic health effects. I will not go through those studies today. But uh, what I'm going to, a study that I'm going to mention here is just a study on, on food residues that was uh, done in 2016 by Mtegwe. So, and colleagues, they analyzed uh, 37,000 uh, samples of pesticide residues and they detected residues in 56% um, of the samples that they tested and that's very that's very significant and uh, what is important here is that uh, res residue values in excess of maximum residue levels were mostly associated with oranges avocados grapefruits and lemons so these these ones what we understand is when we are eating these ones, we normally just peel them. We peel and then we throw away the peel. But when these, some of these fruits are used in making fruit juices, they don't peel them, they just crush them. So that is very important when, to remember when the next time you are going to buy a fruit juice, you should know that the fruit, the peel was also crushed and there's a likelihood that they are, pesticides residues in that, uh, in that fruit juice. Uh, so the maximum residue levels and daily intake, uh, acceptable daily intake. So these are just the guidelines that specify that, okay, uh, this level of exposure or this level of uh, exposure to this uh, particular pesticide is safe. But what is important now is when we are dealing with pesticides, which we call endocrine disrupting pesticides, there's really no acceptable level because every level of exposure is very significant. So that is very important again to remember. Then um, for those who didn't know, Here's an interesting um, fact. So there's a class of mycotoxins, uh, feminisms, which was discovered in South Africa in 1988. Well, other sources say in, in 1990. It's always, well, it amazes me that it, this is something that was discovered recently, but uh, there are already two deaths. But so 1998, and exposure to feminisms is responsible reportedly highest in provinces such as Eastern Cape and Limpopo. So the reason why it's highest in these two provinces is because people in these provinces are exposed to the mold that, that exists on homegrown maize. And when people normally come across a maize cob such as the one that appears on the screen, what people immediately think is that, well, it's just the effect of a worm, maybe it's rotten because there's, there was an, a worm. And sometimes people just feed this to chickens because they say it's rotten so we can feed it to chickens, which is actually very risky because when you eat the chickens, you are also now exposing yourself to the, to the mycotoxin. So the, main, the consumption of maize contaminated with uh, this mycotoxin is associated with high incidence of um, esophag esophageal carcinoma and neural tube defects. So these are just the birth defects that uh, are related to brain, spine, and spinal cord. 
in the Eastern Cape and Limpopo provinces. So quite a number of studies have actually been done in these two provinces, and there's actually that, uh, that correlation that has actually been established. And what is of concern is that uh, maize is the main grain produced and consumed as a staple food in South Africa. And contamination by feminism is, is found almost in, in all the provinces of South Africa. But this is a regional problem, it's an African problem that is actually an issue that we need to deal with. So just in my conclusion and recommendation, we need to think about uh, dietary diversity uh, and awareness is also very important. And uh, we need also to come up with uh, alternative means for pesticide management, maybe think about biopesticides. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cliff. Um, it's great to be able to see, I mean, uh, it is alarming, but it is also good for us to see what is happening in South Africa. Um, and so I am going to be introducing our next panelist. Um, our next panelist is Rachel Thompson, and she has experience spanning international development, global health and food systems. The common thread being a commitment to promote equity in health and beyond. She is currently a policy advisor at the World Obesity Federation, where she leads advocacy work with the UN agencies to advance multi-sector action on malnutrition in all its forms. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much, Nanina and everyone, for uh, the opportunity to be part of this webinar, which is really exciting for me. Um, a little bit out of my normal world of obesity and global health, but that's, um, that's all the better. So I'll just start screen sharing now. Um, start the slideshow, I'll do it this way. Ah, there we go. Um, great. So here I am. I'm Rachel Thompson, a policy advisor at the World Obesity Federation. Also highlighting that today I'm actually also representing the Global Climate Health Alliance, which some of you in the audience may be familiar with, um, which is an, a really impressive consortium of many different civil society organizations and health professionals all around the world, working to advocate on climate and health issues and to really get the health narrative and health sector issues into the climate um, into the sorry into the into the climate um, space. Let me see. It's going to slip slip through automatically, but never mind. So here's my outline: World Obesity Federation. Um, an overview, just in case. Uh, I imagine some of you may have not heard of us before. I'm going to talk about obesity and COVID. Of course, we can't uh, we can't ignore it right now, and try and answer answer the the question on multi systems and different approaches that we need with by looking at this specific, specific question of what obesity has got to do with climate change, um, which I think is a really important one and one that illustrates a lot of the work that we need to do around multi-system approaches for policy and advocacy. So I'm gonna talk about the global syndemic, which I'll, uh, I'll leave you hanging with for now. Um, and what we, what we call is part of the global syndemic, what we call triple duty actions, um, to tackle some of these big issues we're talking about around nutrition and climate. I'm going to also introduce World Obesity's core advocacy um, and policy approach at the moment, which is called ROOTS, very much grounded in systems and different systems needed um, that we need to involve and different stakeholders. And finally end with a, with a call to action. So here is World Obesity, here we are in, uh, as represented by our strategic goals. Um, so you can see there we're very much working under the banner of global targets. So the World Health Organization has set targets which are being shamefully missed on obesity. We are sure you'll be familiar with the um, Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs as well, specifically SDG 3 on health and SDG 2 on um, on hunger and food and malnutrition. So those are the those are the core, um, the kind of overarching 
global targets that we're working towards in all of our policy and advocacy. Um, beneath that, we can see how we how we operate as, a, as an NGO. We do advocacy, we convene, we also train and build capacity in obesity, which is something that you, some of you in the audience might be interested in as health professionals. We do uh, have an amazing program called SCOPE. Um, so if you're interested in that, just uh, yeah, check it out on the website. I think Nanine will be sharing some links as well. And we also do data and we also do knowledge and I'll be sharing you some of that shortly. Um, and finally, yeah, just to highlight that we work across different systems. We recognize that obesity is a very complex issue that is also linked to climate change. That is also, of course, an individual issue, but a societal one and, and one that um, is now being um, certainly in, in the UK. And I'd be interested to hear in South Africa what the situation is, but um, in relation to COVID-19, because we are seeing so much more higher mortality with people that people among people that are having obesity. So moving on just to set the global context, some, some big numbers, some big worrying numbers, and also some, some big worrying trends, um, especially this, this rapid increase that we're seeing in low and middle income countries like South Africa. And we're, we're now in the position where more people in the world are, are living with overweight or obesity than are underweight. So really this, this narrative that we have of needing to feed the world and um, you know that we might see in terms of um, the, uh, international development, it's it's becoming outdated, and we need we need different approaches, and we need multi-system approaches and multi-stakeholder um, approaches to tackle these issues. So I've also got a slide on childhood obesity just to, to make that point that childhood obesity is is a global scandal the way it is increasing so fast. And here, um, I'm sure you'll be aware of some of the key issues around marketing and regulating. Um, things like soft, um, sweetened sugar, sugar and sweetened beverages to children are massive issues all around the world. So what does this look like in South Africa? Well, um, here's, here's some data um, that my colleagues have prepared. I also wanted to highlight World Obesity has a global obesity observatory, which is awesome. And it has interactive, it's very interactive. So you can type in your country and Find, um, find out what the situation is in terms of rates and prevalence and draw your own graphs. And it also tells you about policies um, and you can see, yeah, see the trends as well. So just want to, to highlight that if you're interested. Um, and also just to highlight with these graphs that certainly in, in South Africa, obesity is, is very gendered. And I'd be really interested to know in the chat, uh, some of your some of the South Africans in the audience, your, your views on, on why that is. Um, we, we do see it a trend across other countries in Africa, as you can see, but um, it's really quite shocking, um, the difference. And I should say these this data is uh, obesity, so that's a BMI of over 30 kilograms per meter squared, but actually overweight is, is closer to 70% um, prevalence in among women in South Africa and around half that for men. So it's really a specific issue um, that I'm sure you are aware of if you're living in South Africa. And here, of course, is, is COVID and a, a, a new report that we, we put out just a, a couple of weeks ago on World Obesity Day with data and analysis to really, really make it, um, un, you know, make it so, so clear that obesity and COVID-19 are linked and countries with a higher percent of population overweight are so much more likely. Um, we got the figure of nearly 90% more likely to have a high COVID death rate. So it really is um, unequivocal there. And so what does the World Obesity Federation do? We do advocacy and uh, we do advocacy across a number of different sectors and systems and, um, and places when we can do that in uh, non-COVID times. So there's a UN Food System Summit coming up this year, which is a really important moment. If you don't know about it already, check it out online. There's a growing community. There's gonna be a lot of noise around that in towards the, uh, the end of the year. Um, so we'll be doing advocacy there. We also have a really strong youth program. We're really keen on that's the healthy voices, elevating youth voices um, as the, the next generation. As we, because we have seen, not least because we have seen the success of um, and the amazing work of the youth climate movement. And what we're also trying to do is to, to, to broaden that. So it's about youth advocating for climate, but also for healthy and sustainable diets and, and some of the things we've been talking about already. Um, so coming to this question that I was tasked with, how can we have a multi-system approach to advocacy and policy change when it comes to nutrition and climate change? So I'm actually going to answer that 
question with another question, which is what has obesity got to do with climate change? Because I think, yeah, as I said earlier, it's, it's a really important one and, and not necessarily obvious on first uh, analysis, but actually in answering it, it brings up some really um, interesting and important answers to, to that question. Um, so what we what we have right now, this is a, a slide to illustrate all the what I would what we call the siloed approach. So we have the health world doing its own reports on uh, non-communicable diseases at the WHO, um, talking about physical activity, um, talking about healthy diets. But then we have have the climate change world doing its own summary for policymakers on what needs to happen for climate change. We have the food world talking about food security and what we need to do there. Um, but these siloed approaches are not working. Um, and that is really the starting point for the global syndemic of obesity, undernutrition and climate change, which is, uh, it was a Lancet commission um, over a number of years that culminated in this report, which uh, again, um, it's available online and there's an executive summary if you, if you don't make it through the whole thing. But what this, this, this commission was set out to do and, and did achieve is to bring together um, these different ish, me mega challenges, um, what we actually were calling pandemics before COVID came along, the pandemics of obesity, undernutrition and climate change to force them to, to be seen together and in doing so to help us come up with some, some real game changing solutions that will not just keep everything in its siloed boxes because we know that that isn't working. So some specific interactions to answer that question on what has obesity got to do with climate change that, that um, the global pandemic brings out is, well, for example, thinking about transport systems, we know that car use, um, when it is not using renewable fuel, um, is a massive contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. We also know that car use and inactive transport forms similarly um, contribute to rising obesity. So on the flip side, if we can have healthy um, transport systems, we can have healthier people. Um, and again, coming back to, uh, I think Gideon's point in, in, in his presentation that what is when it, what, what is good for the for, for humans is also good for the planet often. Um, so also, of course, red meat, which I, I won't go into, but we know that eating less, red, we really know now after the presentation, we saw that eating less red meat um, is such a critical action needed. Um, also some more kind of um, nuanced issues, like we know that children that are born to mothers who are underweight have a higher risk of child and adulthood child and adulthood obesity so um this uh, the the green icon in the bottom we also know from from cliff's presentation that um climate change is causing droughts potentially and and you know in the worst case scenario famines and actually what we might find is then well we do find that too many women um of reproductive age are still malnourished and undernourished but ironically those women are going to give birth to children that are at higher risk of obesity so it's all it's it's all linked and that's uh, that's i guess my key message if, if you only take one thing away from this uh presentation just to go into a bit more detail the the syndemic approach the multi-system approach that we're arguing for is um it's about shifting from an individual view uh, which actually i would argue not i'm not i'm not a physician but um um a clinician but in 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 um, certainly in the medical world we we do have an individual centric model of, of the patient of course um but that doesn't necessarily help us with tackling the bigger population level and, and planetary issues. What we need to do is shift to systems thinking. And this is a, a graphic from the Lancet Commission report where we can see, I'm sure um, many of you uh, panelists and on the audience will be happy to see natural systems at the center. So it's it's recognizing that national natural systems are influenced by human systems and of course the way we govern those systems and as well as our individual actions. But we need to think about all these things as interconnected. So ecological health and well-being is not separate from human health and well-being, which I think is, is coming out as a key message of this of this whole event. But thinking this way also helps us look at the common drivers that are leading to this situation of obesity, rising obesity, perpetuating undernutrition and climate change. Um, and so we, what we, this graphic shows is that there's um, 
many different systems and and um, and kind of levels that this works through. So I've talked about yeah the transport system, of course, the food system contributes to obesity, undernutrition, and climate change. But we can change that and and going more micro within within workplaces and public spaces, we can make those more healthy for people and planet. So what do we need to do? So these are some very top level recommendations, but I think they're, they're, they're very powerful um, and they're certainly what we're, World Obesity and others are still advocating for, what we call triple duty action. So you have a policy, rather than having a policy that is just focused on tackling obesity, why not have a policy that can also tackle undernutrition and climate change? So some examples that I'll just whisk through here would be having guidelines that ideally would be um, kind of leaking as a, a, where that's possible so that we so that when for example in public um, public institutions that any any school food which is a you know a massive um, a massive opportunity to really change their and to influence the nutrition of, of you know billions of children around the world to make sure that that is healthy and sustainable food being served up so we also we, we've talked about red reducing red meat consumption um, but thinking about it as and when when you're talking to policymakers if you ever do presenting it as something not just to tackle climate change but actually for nutrition and um, reducing obesity as well because policymakers like things that are efficient that will do many things and will keep many stakeholders happy transport mode shifts I've talked about again the triple win solution um, restricting commercial influences gets a little bit more um, complex because we know that uh, I think there was a, a question posted. We know that there's a lot of opposition to what we're talking about, to making the world um, and the policy more healthy and sustainable. And actually, we need to tackle that and uh, and thinking about it from this from this endemic perspective of the same. It's the same commercial influences and interests that are contributing to rising obesity that are also in some ways contributing to climate change. So again, it's, it's helping us see these things as linked and also see the solutions as linked. So it's, uh, even at the kind of the normative level, thinking about a right to well-being, supposed to have just, we have the right to health, we have the right to food, but bringing these together could be very powerful. And finally, just a point on the need for legislation um, and something that is floated around is the idea of a framework convention on food systems, which would be a way to really entrench all of this in, in a legally binding way. So I'll just quickly introduce you to World Obesity's primary app uh, and our policy, um, our key policy asks, which are, uh, we use the acronym ROOTS, which you can see along the side um, alongside there, um, the different what the difference uh, um, what the acronym stands for. But I wanted to zero to um, to hone in on the systems based approach, the S in roots, because that's uh, very relevant to our discussions right now. So we can really see the different systems involved and the different policy actions needed in the different systems that are all needed because. What we see, what we see with obesity and climate change, arguably, is a very fragmented approach. Um, some countries doing this, some countries doing that. Some people advocating for this, some people advocating for that. Not always agreeing, which is, which is of course great. Like you know, the the meat versus the the beef versus chicken conversations. These are these are important dialogues that need to happen. But um, really grounding everything in a systems based approach is so so vital. And just a really quick illustration of this in action. So we convene, World Obesity convenes, and in India, um, which is really suffering the global pandemic, rising obesity, rapidly rising obesity, still too many people hungry. And yet, the, yeah, and at the same time as the impacts of climate change hitting hard every day. So we, we bring together different parts of government. So agriculture, health, climate, environment people, even some parts of the private sector as well, to, to brainstorm and to see what does this mean in, in, in India and in different parts of India um, and to, un to understand but then also to think through some of the common solutions the triple duty actions in the context of India and be great to, to, to replicate something similar in, in South Africa if there's interest. Um, finally, um, my call to action. So it's, it's wonderful to have a Lancet Commission. It's wonderful to have all the policy summaries and briefs and advocacy, et cetera, et cetera. But um, it's actually still not enough. And this is a, a great quote from one of the co-chairs of the Lancet Commission who sees civil society as a sleeping giant. Um, so this is this is really my call to action now in terms of what, what you and the audience can do. Um, 
this year and and uh, especially in in the lead up to, to COP26, there's going to be a lot uh, a lot happening, um, especially also around the UN Food Systems Summit. So a few ideas here. I think it's really about strengthening the mandate of the health profession. So thinking about how can you integrate into universal health coverage, into primary health care, the principles of better nutrition and sustainability. How can we make this all a much more integrated endeavor, which is the which is the mandate of, of the SDGs, but we're not necessarily doing that well enough yet. Collaboration, of course, is so, so key. And uh, I think we are, we are getting better, but it's still hard. We have different languages. Uh, we have different focuses. Like I mentioned, you know, for the health sector, the, the focus is too often often the individual patient at the expense of thinking about the broader picture and the determinants of health health. But also a key point is, is using your influence, uh, especially the, the doctors and, and the qualified health professionals in the audience, you, you know, and as well as, of course, students, you all have a voice um, and you have a really important voice. And my, my challenge to you is, is to use that. And I'm actually doing some, some really great work with uh, an organization called the Global Alliance for the Future of Food on this very topic. We want to engage more with the health sector, health professionals, to, do, to, to, to talk about climate, but also to talk about healthy and sustainable diets as, and integrate that into your day-to-day -day lives and work. So I'm, we've got a toolkit, it's coming soon. And I just wanted to kind of put that out there as, um, uh, yeah, I'll be really keen to follow up with uh, participants um, that, um, from the different organizations. I'll, I'll check the list uh, when the registration list, because there's some really exciting stuff coming up. Um, so that's, I think that's me done just to say thank you. And there's my contact details. Uh, you, if, yeah, please don't hesitate to be in touch. I always like to hear from people um, working in similar areas, but also in different areas and from different perspectives, um, especially on this theme of collaboration. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. And um, I did put all of the links in, um, in the chat if anybody wants to follow up and check out the awesome work that they're doing. Um, I'm going to hand over the next panelist or introduce Dr. Tushar Mehta. He is a physician and co-founder of Plant-Based Data, an online database which collects and organizes the most important academic and institutional literature regarding the impact of a plant-based diet on health, environment, and food security, including the role of animal agriculture in creating pandemics. The resource source is free to access and meant to assist others with education, writing, and policy work, and it will also be in the chat now. So welcome, um, Doctor, and I'm going to hand it over to you. Hello, uh, Nanine. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to uh, on this occasion. And I'm just going to share my screen. I'm speaking to everybody from Toronto right now. Let's see if this works over here. Can you guys see the screen? Yes, it's OK. OK, so my name is Dr. Tushar Mehta. Um, I do family medicine, but mostly emergency medicine. And I worked a night shift last night. So excuse me if I'm a little bit tired. I also do some international health work. I've done some work in India where I've seen these problems about obesity and Haiti currently and uh, have an interest in human rights and uh, international development, ecological issues, plant-based diet as well. Okay, so here's our website that uh, it's, it's kind of new. Okay, it's less than a year old, this project, but we're continually expanding our database and um, uh, about topics, you know, critical topics re uh, related to plant-based diet. There's been a great interest in plant-based diet that's uh, increasing over the past uh, decade, I would say, um, much more rapidly. And you see all these athletes and celebrities that are getting tuning into it. A lot of bodybuilders, uh, ultimate fighters, uh, tennis champions that are, that are getting into it. There's a great movie called The Game Changers, which um, can be interesting to a lot of you. All right. Now, there are um, environmental impacts, which Gidon has uh, um, uh, so nicely explained. I'm going to take a slightly different angle at the same time, uh, but I'll be brief. And if we look at the world population, it's currently almost 8 billion people, and it's uh, soon to be 10 billion. As Rachel mentioned, there's enough calories to feed the world, but there's actually not enough nutritious food to feed the world. There's not enough fruits and vegetables and, um, uh, and, and uh, maybe even a shortage of protein in terms of uh, the ability to, for everybody to have a well-balanced diet. So there's enough calories, but there's not enough total nutrition grown in the world to 
feed everybody, even if it were shared around. Okay. 10,000 years ago, if you look at population, humans were less than 1% of the terrestrial biomass. This is data from Va Dr. Vaclav Smil. And we had all these other animals, right? We were one of many species. But currently, humans make up a third of the world's biomass. Our livestock makes up about two thirds of the planetary terrestrial biomass. And uh, uh, wild animals make up uh, only 1% because we've decimated their numbers and increased our numbers at the same time. Other papers uh, um, rate this as maybe um, 4% in terms of terrestrial uh, um, vertebrates or mammal biomass compared to our livestock, but it's the same order of magnitude. And if we look at chickens on Earth, because there's been talk of, you know, a chickens, um, uh, this animal, which has been bred into existence by humans, that single species of animal weighs about three times the biomass of all wild species of birds combined. So it gives you an appreciation of the scale of how humans change the earth and dominate biomass. Uh, and uh, we can see these statistics um, that Gidden also mentioned about different uh, plant-based versus animal-based uh, products that people eat and their uh, greenhouse gas emissions and this uh, and the land use that Kitten also mentioned the same chart I'm putting there about how much of a smaller area of land is able to grow a much more massive amount of food. And this statistic, uh, uh, which comes from United Nations data and uh, shows that a very small portion of land uh, creates, uh, you know, plant-based food that creates plant-based proteins still creates, uh, still grows, um, more than 63% of the global protein supply. So a very small area of food grows a very large amount of protein. This is what Gidden was talking about. And therefore we can grow so much more food on such a smaller amount of land if we go with the optimized and, and plant-based uh, proteins, which are whole grains and, and, and legumes basically. All right, grazing does not, uh, you know, grazing uh, at low density may improve local soil conditions, but it produces far less food on far greater amounts of land and therefore alters that land, causing many kinds of problems, uh, including some of the ones that I've mentioned over here, but it, it does, you know, uh, grazing does not support natural grasslands. There's a lot of alterations that occur through grazing, especially things like killing of predators to protect your animals, etc. And there's a lot of misinformation that is promoted by industry right now, and that's their major industry thrust at the moment is to promote grass-fed beef and cause all kinds of confusion uh, regarding soil carbon sequestration, and I have a um, recent uh, um, article uh, that sort of debunks one of their papers and sort of describes the systemic things that they are sort of misrepresenting. All right, when we talk about fish, which is considered uh, a food that doesn't use so much land and causes less climate change perhaps um, because it's not done on land, uh, we should think of the statistics and the impact actually on the oceans. And we are, taking millions of tons, uh, including uh, unregulated, uh, illegal and undocumented fish, and taking between one and two trillion tons of fish per year from the ocean. And that amounts to about, uh, sorry, two, 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 one to two trillion fish uh, per year from the ocean. And that amounts to roughly 30 to 60,000 fish per second that are taken from the ocean. When it comes to terrestrial animals, uh, we slaughter about um, uh, uh, 70 to 80 uh, uh, billion uh, land animals per year. So, you know, it gives you an idea of the scale here that we're dealing with, okay, um, in terms of just how many, you know, uh, um, animals per second that we are um, consuming. And the International Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, because of these fundamental problems, has come out and said that you know, animal agriculture is one of the leading causes of uh, the sort of annihilation of biodiversity on Earth in this sort of ecological genocide that is occurring right now. Okay? And uh, there are other impacts as well that are combined with the with uh, uh, the problem of animal agriculture that is, you know, just change in population, land use, fragmentation, and materials economy, pollutants, climate change, uh, you know, urban design, transportation, and, um, you know, things that Cliff was mentioning as well in terms of um, uh, chemical usage. And the Eat Lancet report, um, 
has uh, just like the Lancet syst uh, syndemic of obesity is talking about switching to more of a plant-based diet in order to grow more food on more nutritious food on less amount of land with much lesser of impact. And uh, you can see that the animal proportion of proteins is very small as recommended by the Eat Lancet. And they also suggest that, hey, if you don't want to eat those animal sources, you don't have to, you can get everything from the plant sources, just like Gidon was talking about. And what is a plant-based diet? A plant-based diet is not just a vegan diet, it includes the option of being vegan, but uh, it means that we get the majority of our protein and calories from plant sources, okay? And we, we want, as physicians who practice medicine, teaching about plant-based diet, we want whole foods, minimally processed foods, or close to whole foods, low-fat overall plant-based diets. And that's what's going to really keep us healthier. And, you know, focusing on the main groups, whole grains, legumes, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds, okay? Now, there are, there's a, a, a huge amount of evidence regarding the beneficial health effects. And Gideon was talking about some nutrients. I'm going to talk more about clinical, the sort of the impact on morbidity and mortality uh, regarding uh, uh, greater plant-based diets. And there are, the, the hard thing for me is which papers to choose. There are, you know, just over the past year and a half, there's been four papers that have, uh, that came out talking about all cause mortality, which is the most important metric uh, about any kind of medical or dietary or other inter intervention. If you can reduce all cause mortality, that's the most important metric that we can impact. And for example, this paper from 2020 talks about, you know, it's a huge uh, uh, cohort study prospective of uh, people followed over 16 years and um, showing that you know, every 3% of energy from animal protein replaced by plant protein uh, re reduces 10% uh, mortality uh, amongst men and women. Now, if you can design a pill that would give you the same benefit, you'd be a trillionaire probably. Um, I would invest in that stock, but this is for free, okay? And um, what we can see is that there's uh, the greatest reduction in cardiovascular mortality. Um, some uh, animal products having a, a higher impact than other uh, animal products and you know a lesser impact on things like cancer. And we'll see this kind of trend being consistent through different studies, okay? Here's another recent paper, 2021, showing that uh, if you look at total impact, uh, total uh, meat, uh, red meat and processed meats, you know, um, if, if there's more than 70 grams per day compared to low consumers, there's increased rates of ischemic stroke, pneumonia. Uh, so it's interesting that um, it affects, you know, body systems that are, are not just cardiovascular disease, diverticulitis, diabetes, okay? Um, big differences there. And when it comes to pole Tree, those effects still exist, but are smaller effects. However, the interesting thing is that when people do consume meat, like such as poultry, and you don't control for the factor of body mass index, uh, then you actually have larger impacts on these same, uh, these same uh, statistics that I mentioned. I haven't included the numbers here. But um, also some other things become statistically significant. So other medical conditions become statistically significant if we um, don't control for body mass index. And what, what that essentially means is that if somebody's eating a lot of chicken, let's say, and it makes them, it contributes them to them being overweight. And that overweight becomes part of the health problems that they endure. Okay, so that means chickens, chicken consumption leads to health problems, some health problems at least, and the overweight uh, aspect of eating more poultry meat uh, further contributes to those problems. If you control for body mass index, that means you're just eliminating the, uh, the, 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 the problems that uh, chicken foods or poultry foods may additionally cause due to body mass index. But that's not entirely fair because the, that type of food is part of the contributor to the body mass index. It's a little bit um, uh, complicated the way I'm explaining it. Maybe I'm not using the right words, but uh, it's something we can hang on to that thought at least. Again, more papers talking about replacement of percentage of plant-based, uh, sorry, animal-based protein and reduction in um, uh, mortality. So you can see that there's a bigger impact for uh, red meat and eggs and things like that, processed meat being the worst, but some smaller impacts for um, replacing fish dairy as well, okay, and poultry. Um, okay, so uh, this is the same data expressed as in, in, in different ways, same data set expressed in different ways, but showing that, again, uh, you have lower mortality rates, okay. Um, 
things about fish people consider fish to be beneficial but you know what really happens here is it depends on what you're comparing to if you're comparing people uh, who consume fish instead of let's say red meat and those kind of foods you will show a benefit but if you look at uh, something like a data set over here where it talks about uh, fish compared to eating plant proteins maybe it's not so beneficial now, I'm going to say that in many trials, there, there's not always a consistent benefit of uh, plant proteins over fish or things like that, but it really depends on what, that, uh, what those plant proteins are and other aspects of the study and how, you know, if people consuming plant proteins are actually consuming healthy plant-based foods versus, versus unhealthy plant-based foods. Okay. Um, but, you know, again, this Cochrane review showed that uh, omega-3 fatty acids are not um, uh, um, are not in, in this case beneficial to cardiovascular disease as is commonly thought. And of course, there are trials showing the, uh, you know, on both sides of the issue, showing some showing some benefits, others not showing benefit, but I'd say it's pretty controversial at this point, whether there is a true benefit or not. And a lot of studies not showing benefit, as well as um, higher rates of uh, toxins in uh, fetal blood on people who cons consume omega-3s, which come from fish and are actually full of toxins. So if we do believe that omega-3s are beneficial, I always tell people to consider getting omega-3s from algae, which has the same marine omega-3s, that's where the fish get them, but they can be created in such a way to be completely toxin-free. Okay. Now, there are evidence regarding cancers and plant-based diet. Um, here's just one study of many that show that um, uh, consuming soy foods actually reduces uh, breast cancer. In this case, it's a recent study showing that, um, you know, it, as compared to dairy, when soy replaces dairy, there's uh, lower rates of breast cancer. Um, and there's similar studies regarding prostate cancer in soy or prostate cancer and plant-based diet showing that people with incremental plant-based diet have reduced rates of prostate cancer, which is um, uh, the most important, uh, most common cancer in men, uh, actually, well, close to lung cancer, because smoking is, uh, um, uh, is one of the highest um, cancer uh, mortality um, uh, contributors to men, as well as women. And uh, the WHO data, of course, that we probably heard about showing that red and prostate uh, sorry, red and processed and meat are, are carcinogens, class uh, 2A and class 1A. Okay, and again, more studies showing that um, uh, various cancers are um, um, partially caused or that animal foods are somewhat contributory to certain types of cancers. Again, red meat being uh, having, having a bigger imp impact than poultry, but and on various types of cancers. Okay. And again, these things change from study to study. The, the cancer data is more moderate as compared to cardiovascular and metabolic data. So data regarding heart disease and diabetes is much stronger than cancer data, but you consistently get this signal from the research that, you know, some amount of cancers are increased by uh, meat products, including some of the poultry products. Okay. Um, Okay, and, uh, you know, a lot of data regarding diabetes. This is just one study. There's other studies that show even a stronger signal that uh, animal-based foods are um, even more impactful in terms of causing diabetes or contributing to diabetes. Okay, and of course, COVID-19 is a result of the animal agriculture industry. When you have mass forms of animal agriculture, when we're talking about millions of animals being housed and moved and slaughtered and uh, handled together, those animals are so concentrated together. These are things that don't occur in nature. In nature, generally speaking, animal uh, populations are more spread apart, most for the most part. And they uh, sort of are in equilibrium with different kinds of viruses, which are not necessarily disease causing to them or disease causing to humans. But when we bring these millions of animals together, um, we then have a sort of this biogenerator of viruses where new virus mutations can occur amongst these populations that become sick also from the overcrowding and that um, different viruses and different pathogens spread amongst those uh, animals, which don't usually um, occur in nature because of this mass congregation of animals 
including different species in close proximity to each other. So these viruses sort of undergoes this natural selection, new mutations occur, some of which become dangerous to humans. COVID-19 is an example occurring from China, but so is Middle Eastern Respiratory Sy Syndrome, SARS coronavirus from 2002, swine flu from 2009. But you can see that you know swine flu comes from a mass animal agriculture comes from factory farming, um, whereas COVID nineteen and things like HIV and Ebola come from more like bush meat and um, live markets and wet markets and things like that. And HIV is also an example of uh, a virus that has come from animals to humans through um, a form of mass animal agriculture. In this case, a type of bush meat wet market type of trade that happened to be in Africa. But the same thing could happen elsewhere. Um, and uh, as we increase our concentration and the mass and number of animals, for example, we may switch from red meat to poultry um, and save on some environmental parameters. But at that same time, we increase that biogenerative viruses and we become more and more at risk of different types of influenza viruses, which especially uh, are endemic in the um, farmed uh, poultry populations. And uh, we're going to have, you know, we could, we could have coming in the future, every five, 10, 15 years, whatever, new pandemics arising from all of this mass global animal agriculture. And they could easily be, you know, having double the mortality, five times the mortality, 10 times the mortality of COVID-19 and cause even a greater devastation than what we see right now, because there could be increase in transmissibility uh, factor, as well as the increase in the, the pathogenicity factor. Okay. I have a podcast about this, which you can look at, and there's good um, references there on the podcast link, as well as in plant-based data. Um, other uh, people have been talking about this for a long time and have essentially predicted that we're going to get these kind of pandemics. It's just a matter of when, and surely um, uh, uh, COVID-19 is an example of something that was pretty much predicted by people in the field who know that this, this is going to happen and we should expect more of this as we expand global animal agriculture. So the overall trends, uh, I spent, I think I spent overall wrong there, sorry for my late night typing, but um, uh, you know that red and uh, processed meat has the greatest health impact, lesser impacts from fish and chicken, um, though there is uh, some signals and research showing that they have impacts and not necessarily as many benefits as they are purported to have. And the benefits that are purported, again, depend on the comparison groups in any particular study. If you're comparing them to people on a you know, a, a, a bad plant-based diet or having high consumption of bread and processed meat, they're going to look beneficial. But if you compare them to optimal plant-based uh, foods, maybe not so much. And there's a, still a lot uh, of information that we're going to get from ongoing studies. So uh, this is a, a, an area that uh, we don't have perfect data on, but we're always learning more. Uh, cancers, uh, we have moderate, more moderate evidence. And, uh, you know, when we're looking at different studies, we have to look at comparison groups. What is one uh, part of the comparison groups in a study being compared to in another part? Looking at the um, types of plant-based diets versus animal foods in the different groups. And when we're looking at uh, um, a study, looking at the intensity and quality of plant-based diet within the group. Uh, for example, one of the studies I showed there, um, you know, there's very small amounts of plant proteins uh, showing the benefits there. But what if people had higher amounts of plant proteins? Okay, we can. Uh, I'm not going to get into it too much. There's not too much time, and it's good for us to look at the consensus of evidence, not just individual foods um, or individual studies. And uh, there are, I've showed cohort studies, but there are also randomized trials that are very interesting to know. And that about wraps it up. I hope I haven't gone too much over time. I know I've spoken very quickly and um, thank, thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much. If anybody is interested in all of that incredible data, please look in the chat um, for the links where you can find a wealth of data from, from plant-based data. And yeah, I have been checking um, the attendee list and I'm happy to see a lot of you guys are here, even though we are running a little bit over time. So we have one more panelist um, to speak, Prof. Andrew Robinson. Um, before I introduce him, I am going to ask anybody from, if there's anybody from the Climate, Energy and Health Special Interest Group 
um, that's online. If you would like to introduce your special interest group um, after Prof Robinson, please send a message to the panelists and we would be happy to um, get you to introduce yourself and your group. And then as well for everybody else, the health professionals, the students, um, if you can stay until the end of the next presentation, you would be getting access to the feedback form so that you can get your CPD points. So I encourage you to stay on so that you can get those CPD points. And um, now I'm going to hand over to Prof Robinson, who is um, chairman and co-founder of Pan South Africa, deputy dean and extraordinary professor at Northwest University Health Sciences faculty. So welcome Prof and I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, uh, Nanine, and uh, greetings to, to all of you. Um, it's it's a, can you see my my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Good. Thank and you. I can hear you. All good. Um, and it's a, a great uh, privilege to um, be part of uh, bringing all this important information across to such a, a wide audience, particularly in South Africa, where there uh, hasn't been much uh, traction in this issue of climate change. And what I'll do, I will uh, try and sum up what has been said and uh, in, a, in a fairly simple framework, because these things are complex and uh, there's very little opportunity for, for uh, linear um, and non-complexity um, uh, approaches to this problem. So I'll look at the, the planet Earth, uh, the aspect of uh, Gaia and the shift and the, 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 the tipping point where humans find themselves or at the point on a crossroads and which, which directions to take and uh, that's linked to, uh, to our conscious uh, development. Uh, it's important to diagnose uh, that there is a problem and that's very important to accept any change. Um, and then look at nutrition's contribution uh, and to climate tra change and to illness. I'm not going to repeat what's been said already. And then look at some of the politics of health uh, because I think health professionals have been rather silent on uh, climate change. Now, uh, our Earth, to bring it home, it's a finite space. It's only, there's only one. Um, and it's alive. And uh, James Lovelock, an independent uh, researcher and academic in the 70s, uh, promoted this um, uh, idea. And it's been since been accepted by the global uh, scientific community. However, that acceptance I'll, I'll question a little bit later. And looking at uh, what the Earth supports, uh, the great qualities of this uh, vast array of life are really quite simple. Um, there's tremendous stabilities, stability. If you think of the cycles of the seasons, for example, the cycles of life and, and death, there's amazing variety and differences. Uh, one of my stock phrases is there's no two things in the universe that's the same. And so that must be important relating to biodiversity. And there's tremendous reserves. It's almost uh, an embarrassment of reserves that if you think of what the planet has to, to feed its, its plant and animal uh, resources, it's, uh, it's an amazing uh, bunch of reserves. But unfortunately, there is now the evidence that certain of, of these um, uh, barriers have been uh, uh, stepped over. And much like a patient that's had a, had a bad illness, they convalesce for a long time until their reserves are built, built up. And I think we'll find the same issue with, with the planetary changes. So life on the planet, um, you know, do we consider it to be Mother Earth, as all First Nations and Indigenous populations uh, have thought about it? 
how is this life started? Well, when the solar energy is intercepted uh, by the Earth's green mantle, and we all life, all life is totally dependent on Earth's air and water. Now, I'm very pleased to hear what uh, Gidden said about the importance of soil, because the soil is really the foundation of healthy life on Earth. And that soil, healthy soil provides healthy plants, and healthy plants provides uh, healthy animals. It is not possible to be independently healthy. It's a fundamental fact. Um, and something that we've ignored a lot, and that's the law of return, life cycles. Most science focuses on birth and growth and maturity and um, um, uh, increases. There's very little focus on death and decay. And those are fundamentally important to the, the, for example, for the health of soil and the mycorrhizal associations that are, are critical for plants to absorb nutrients. Now, to diagnose uh, the state of the planet, we've spoken about the biodiversity uh, loss. Uh, Tushar illustrated that brilliantly. Um, the loss of natural habitat, there's not enough space for, left for nature. But, um, and this loss of natural habitat is one of the reasons for zoonotic spillover. As I said, the planetary boundaries have been uh, reached in many uh, aspects, and uh, all those indicate a reduced hab uh, habitability of the planet. And uh, we've seen the symptoms of that. COVID is a definite symptom of that. Um, and the contributions of the food systems, we're just doing it too efficiently. We're wasting too much, too much energy. And food insecurity has been the cause of the collapse of previous civilizations. And now with humans occupying directly or indirectly the whole planet, the whole planet now is at risk. So the question remains, how can we nurture ourselves and the planet or nourish? Nourish is another means uh, for the word nurture. On this planet diagnosis in a bit more detail, infertility is always precedes soil, uh, uh, is always preceded by uh, precedes soil erosion. The toxic chemicals, um, Cliff spoke, spoke about, about them, and uh, the diversion of the military industry. Uh, as the World War II drew, drew to a close, those industries were kicking their heels, and that has just been directed in, into the agricultural, agricultural um, uh, sector with the petroleums and explosives contributing to the nitrogen phosphate, potassium fertilizers, um, and nerve gases, Agent Orange, to all the biocides that, that were mentioned. And then I split diseases of livestock and animals and humans, because sometimes humans don't like to be considered as animals. But you can see how the war, this war against life, is perpetuated in um, maintaining health. Um, and the exponential rise in zoonotic uh, diseases uh, is, uh, mirrors the development in industrial uh, agriculture. And, um, we're not as healthy as we should be. Uh, we can thank COVID for that, because for once at a global level, there's a recognition that we are not well. And that's vital to uh, make any uh, attempt at healing. There has to be an acceptance of uh, the status quo. Um, and, and that status quo is, uh, uh, is not the ideal one, and that will motivate the uh, the move towards something better. So I've showed how, and I reiterate how, it's not, an, not possible to be independently healthy. And that links link to the diversity loss is critical. Um, as far back as 2012, they showed that the microbiome of the GRT uh, gut, any, the lack in that could, was predictive of what cancer will occur. Uh, that's just a tiny little snapshot of what, what is possible. And uh, the development of non-communicable disease is really slow and difficult to, to link this uh, with, with the uh, 
um, single uh, injury uh, insults to to health, trauma, and maternity, and acute infections. You can see cause and effect. But someone has been uh, over years and years and years, and suddenly drops down with uh, a, a chronic illness, uh, struggles to see the link between their plate, which I'll defend. And I think that's much like you see any animal defending their food. That's a really archaic um, uh, um, behavior that is, is makes um, eating behaviors difficult to change. So what do we need for a healthy human species? We need to accept the diagnosis. Uh, we, we need to accept that the climate crisis is a medical, uh, has a medical emergency component. Um, we've got to fundamentally change the way in which we manage uh, uh, the land. Um, and diversity-based regenerative agriculture is very important. What is our planetary healthy diet and reduced waste? In South Africa, a third of edible food is wasted uh, annually. And that's just food. Think of all the other wastes that if you go to a, a landfill site um, uh, and it's, it's amazing. So in adapting, it's a complex problem. And there are three types of problems. You've got the easy problem, simple to resolve. Uh, I can't connect and you've just got to reconnect or something, your computer, difficult ones. I thought perseverance was a difficult problem. You need more effort and re resources. You can really uh, salute those physicists who must have had some awesome physics to get that perseverance onto Mars. And what we face is, a, is complex and that's global warming, climate change, health, uh, service provision and, and is the most complex human activity. And that's why I contrasted it with something like space um, exploration, it's complex. So in this space, where are we? Uh, 10,000 years ago, we separated from nature as we started our agricultural journey. 400 years ago, um, the mechanistic um, Newtonian uh, science viewed uh, nature as a machine to be exploited by man, gender deliberate uh, phrasing. And uh, now, where are we now? We definitely at a cusp where uh, this whole paradigm uh, shift in, in uh, consciousness needs to take on board. Um, you know, you can see how these have, have shifted with Galileo moving us from, uh, from uh, Center, center of the, the world to having uh, to not being the truth, and the uh, placement of human beings within this uh, within pl the planet Earth is uh, is important, and that's the most uh, important scientific paradigm to recognize uh, uh, these big shifts. In, in human thought. So the big debate at the moment is, is it, do we reset? And I am concerned that uh, the, uh, Anthropocene has got us here. Um, and it's likely that uh, as a reset, if you reset your computer, you hope to find all your programs again. And uh, I don't think uh, the risks of dominance that are plaguing this, this um, economic and political framework, uh, the planet, the dominance of it, and how it's plundered, uh, how the genders are uh, similarly, and uh, the race issues. And that's, that's uh, you've seen this almost as recently as yesterday with, for example, vaccine distribution and, and buying. I think transformation is what is, is uh, possibly a, a, a path to, to follow. Um, and I take uh, some of the guidance from LaDonna Harris and the four hours of indigeneity, looking at responsibility, community engagement, uh, reciprocity, the cyclical nature of, of life, redistribution with the importance of equity and relationships with all life. So we need to accept that we're part of Gaia. Um, all future endeavors need to shift towards the reverence for life. Um, and that means our scientific 
um, paradigm at the moment is we at war with this virus, we've got to defeat it, we've got to kill it and, and defend ourselves with a vaccine. Um, and that goes with all the other aspects of the war against um, uh, the uh, weeds and, and uh, uh, in, in agriculture. Uh, I can understand it. I've got a small permaculture, small holding, and the weeds have beaten me totally uh, this year. It's done a lot of carbon capturing, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm doing it uh, with, with our chemicals and it's definitely possible um, to get the diversity and remembering that healing is possible and the earth can heal just as humans can heal and to conclude climate is complex no one understands it properly so we need to tackle the things which we know we are doing wrong and i think there are a lot of them and if we align ourselves in such a complex thing if we align ourselves just as um, most many games that have a ball, if you focus on the ball, or if you take your eye off the ball, you lose the game. And that ball is the planet, is our, is our mother earth. And if all our activities can go through the filter of saying, is this in the best interests of an alive mother earth? And that's all us, we, in South Africa, we've got amazing scientific capacity. But it's still aligned in, in the uh, in the dated paradigm of uh, uh, and that's part of the mobilization that we need to do. We need to mobilize around the politics of well-being, not a, a, around the battle against disease and the battle against uh, life on on on, on Earth. Um, you know, pests, for example, are a symptom that the soil isn't well. Uh, Albert Howard describes it extremely well. And um, it's just like COVID is a symptom. We're not going to, to restore health by uh, eliminating uh, COVID. Um, the coronavirus has been with us for, for centuries. And it's just that uh, it finds us, in, in, it's just like a weed exploits a situation of, of disturbed uh, uh, natural earth. Um, COVID has, has found that. And just a, a small comment on, uh, on the importance of nutrients and all those were shown, the benefits of plant-based versus uh, animal proteins. Recently, I've come to the attention of nutrient density. And this, for example, can be explained quite simply that uh, if, uh, if you have a carrot that's, that's grown on healthy soil, with clean water and clean air. It has 90 times more nutrients of a carrot that's grown on sterile soils with chemicals thrown on, onto it and maybe chemical water, except a chemical fertilizer and other biocides. 90 times. So you, to get the same amount of nutrients as that one carrot, you've got to eat 90 carrots. So maybe that should be the measurement of uh, of nutrient capacity on, on the planet, what nutrients we can provide to the population and not what yields we can provide. And I'll close with that, that thought. So thank you and any questions, let me know. And Thank you, Prof. Robinson. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I have, um, we have heard incredible information today. Um, I'd like to thank all of the panelists uh, for being here and for sharing their, their science and their dedication and their art with us. And um, I hope that this webinar has shed light on the complexity of global health and where we are at in this present moment, um, struggling with uh, our global health as well as planetary health. Mm -hmm and that there are many perspectives and there are many ways to support this. Um, and wherever you find your interest lies, I encourage you to look up more about that and to find ways that you can contribute. So um, if you haven't seen, there is um, in the link um, in the chat, 
to answer um, a feedback form for your CPD points. Uh, I hope that you guys answer that feedback. It's really amazing for us to know what you enjoy and what you would like to see more of, as well to understand what level of education you received on climate change and plant-based diets. Um, and then if you are interested, um, you can also go onto um, our Facebook group, Physicians Association for Nutrition South Africa, to see when we will be um, doing an event like this again. Um, I did take a look through the Q&A, um, and unfortunately, because we have gone over time, most of the Q&A was actually answered. So the ones that we could answer best was answered by the panelists. So I am, um, with that said, I thank you all for tuning in. It is an honor to be here and to be sharing this information with you. And I hope to stay in touch thank you to our panelists and I hope you all have a beautiful evening.